Hello class, so today we're going to talk about a term you will hear me use a lot in class and that is rhetoric. And rhetoric has a bunch of different definitions but really what we're talking about is communicating what you want and learning how to see through the manipulation of others. When we talk about rhetoric, we're talking about method. So you have something you want people to hear you say, how do you say it in order for them to hear it? Rhetoric is commonly defined as the art of persuasion and there is a lot of art to persuasion. In other words, if you want someone to get the snow off of your lawn, you can say, well, I need to uh, have this snow shoveled off my sidewalk, off my front yard, whatever. Or you can say, I've got unassembled, unassembled snowmen for sale, cheap. Come and buy some. You can say that you have uh, water for sale, or you can say that this is ethos water, which will help provide water for those who don't have access to free water or good quality water in developing countries. You can also do this with storytelling. You can come right out and say imagine a scary kid or you can show me a kid in a way that makes me believe that that kid is scary like this kid from Looper. You can say I like local coffee shops better or you can say friends don't let friends drink Starbucks. You can say, be happy, regardless of whether or not the world is sad. Or you can show me what it's like to be happy in a sad world full of blue faces. Rhetoric is about helping other people see the world the way that you do. Helping them understand your perspective on things. That's true if you think the world is a sunshine, happy place where mothers play with their children in the parks. Or if you think that it is, as Thomas Hobbes said, nasty, brutish, and short. Maybe you think that we are all alone, even though we're all together, we are isolated. Or maybe you think that life is tough and you've just got to slug through each day. So when we talk about rhetoric, one of the best things to do is to, to think about each of the elements. So we're going to break this down to six elements. Ethos, pathos, and logos are the traditional ways to talk about this, and we'll define those in a second. But they are also paired with speaker, audience, and topic. These are the six elements. Now, we could say, well, if you imagine ethos is connected to this corner of a triangle, and pathos is the top, and logos is the other side, then you can see how speaker relates to ethos on that corner, and audience relates to the peak, and topic relates to logos in that corner. But that gets really messy. Just think of this as two groups of three. We're going to go through these one at a time. Now, let's start with ethos. Ethos, think ethics. And when we talk ethics, what we're really talking about is value. Now, this is the most difficult concept, usually, for students to grasp. So I'm starting with it right off the bat. When we talk about ethos, we're talking about values. And if you're trying to persuade someone to see the world the way that you do, the best thing you can do is share a value with that person. So think about who my audience is, what values do we share, this is the value I'm trying to put out there. Now this is a, a photograph of a famous astronaut, Neil Armstrong, first human being to set foot on the moon. Really important figure. Now we see the American flag on his shoulder, but we also see the American flag behind him. This is from a memorial picture after Neil Armstrong died. Now why is the American flag partnered with Neil Armstrong? Because it represents a particular set of values. And that values, if you think about the founding of our country, have to do with exploration, freedom, sacrifice. Now, Neil Armstrong represented those things. He was a pioneer. He explored things. He went where no one had ever gone before. A great symbol for liberty, a great symbol for freedom, a great symbol for American ingenuity and where it can lead you. Now, we can contrast that with this character from Pirates of the Caribbean. And you can look at him, and right away, you can tell that his character represents different values. So whether we're looking at the figure on the left, Neil Armstrong, real human being, who represented values through his real-life acts, or we're looking at storytelling on the right, when we consider this is a, a troublemaker, miscreant, um, not a very responsible or successful figure, he looks unclean, he looks confused and bewildered, even as a crook, this guy doesn't actually look like he's doing a particularly good job, then we can see that different values are represented 
by each of these visuals. And if you can learn to spot those values, then you really will be able to understand how people are trying to communicate with you and how you can better communicate with others. This is the Rolling Stones logo. Now this is very confrontational. If you think about somebody sticking their tongue out at other people, I've got a four-year-old son and I don't particularly like it when he sticks his tongue out. I admonish him not to do that. Why? Because it's rude and it's confrontational to have a logo that is doing this rude thing. Well, that actually represents the values of the Rolling Stones. So here's a band who came out with a, a very rebellious kind of image and they have lived up to that image in their lyrics and their performances and their lifestyles. The Rolling Stones represent a value of rebelliousness against authority, against convention, and that's why this logo is so perfect for them. It's not that you have to have great values, it is what are the values. Be specific when you talk about what those values are. So ethos is values. That brings us on to pathos. Now pathos is emotion. Think about what the audience feels. This isn't about what the speaker feels, it's about what you trigger the audience to feel. So if we start with this image, this is a very um, standard type of image, sadly, of some children who are very malnourished in Africa. And this kind of image is often used as a plea for help. Why? Because it makes us feel horrible sadness and despair for the children in these developing countries. And that should trigger us to, if we share values with uh, the speaker on the need to help other people in other places who are less fortunate than we are, that should lead us to actually help them. Now that emotion, this is pity, this is feeling sorry for somebody, feeling an, a sense of obligation that we need to help them if that is our value, but any emotion can be part of how we communicate with others and how others communicate with us. So this could be humor. Um, I haven't had my coffee yet, don't make me kill you. Uh, you guys, if you don't know me very well yet, you will understand my deep love for coffee. And this humor can also be used to try to communicate. Don't take this message too seriously, but seriously, I need my coffee. It also can have to do with very much more complex emotions. Here we see a couple in bed, um, Antonio Banderas on the left, and we see this, this interaction between the husband and the wife laying in bed together obviously feeling some very complex conflicting emotions. This is not a happy space right here. There's a lot of tension even though they're physically close. And that emotion is critical for us to understand and relate to characters as well. So again, whether we are dealing with these nonfiction situations or with fictional narrative situations, we're still thinking about how does the audience feel in relation to this character, this situation, this prompt. So with ethos we have values, with pathos we have feelings, and with logos we have logic. So what is it that you are actually supposed to think at the end of this? On the right here you see an Axe commercial. Now Axe is infamous for horrible imagery of women and this advertisement makes no exception. Uh, this is literally a woman as a puppet implying that if you use our product, women will be your puppets. You can get them to do whatever you want. And just to drive home the point of sexual puppetry home, uh, this woman is not wearing very many clothes, and uh, that, that just reinforces the sexuality. Now, I don't put any of these images in here because I promote them, but because these are the images that surround us in the media, and Axe is one of the, the most offensive in terms of the ways that it shows women. So what are we supposed to think? Use this product, women will be your puppets. Clear message of this ad. Also, what are we supposed to think in response to films? Well, here we have three characters. Here they are dressed all in very similar ways. So we are supposed to think about the connections between these characters. We have Bane, who is very obviously a psychotic bad guy. We have Batman in the middle. We have Catwoman on the left, who if you've seen any of the Batman mythology, comic books or movies, you know that Catwoman is not really a good guy, but she's not really a bad guy either, but sometimes she is, and sometimes she's a good guy. Uh, so where is Batman? Batman is kind of in the middle of these. Where, where are his values? What is his character? 
when is he the good guy and when is he the bad guy? And this is prompting us to think this way. I'm not going to give you a thematic statement based on this, but it is obviously trying to drive us to make connections between these characters. It's dressing them the same. They are all masked. They are all in black. They are lined up next to each other. We are supposed to be making comparisons. That is part of the logic of what's going on here. So we know that when we're talking about ethos, pathos, and logos, we are really talking about what do you value, what are you as the audience feeling, and what is the audience thinking at the end of your art or as they watch it. So that brings us into value, feel, and think, which are the terms I'm going to use most often instead of ethos, pathos, and logos. And how do those relate to the speaker? Well, the speaker is the point of view, whose point of view is this story being told from. Uh, Memento is an amazing film. It's told from the point of view of a character who has uh, short-term memory issues. He can only remember things for a very short time. And the plot is told to us in reverse, so we have as little sense of what's going on as the main character does. If that story was told from any other point of view, it would be an entirely different story. Here is a, an advertisement for Coke and Pepsi. Is it trying to tell us that Pepsi is good or that Coke is good? Well, if you know that this is a Pepsi advertisement, you know where it's going. And even if you didn't initially, you should quickly arrive at, oh, this is from Pepsi's point of view. Uh, Pepsi is somehow aggressively devouring Coke because Pepsi is more powerful, because Pepsi has more market share, because of who knows what. But Regardless of, of exactly why, because the Logos is a little unclear here, it is clear that the point of view is from an advocate of Pepsi. So we've got values, emotion, and logic. We've got our speaker. And now let's think about our audience. Now we mentioned the audience before when we were talking about emotion, but think about this in, in broader terms. If I'm talking to a bunch of kids, elementary school, preschool kids, and I'm trying to convince them of something, I'm going to use a very different rhetoric, a very different method, than I am going to if my audience is a teenager and I'm a parent and I'm trying to talk to the parents. And I, as speaker, parent, talking to teenager audience, I'm trying to get the teenager to understand where I'm coming from, and that's a very different message to a teenager who obviously resents her parents in this picture than it is to a bunch of happy preschool kids. What if you have as your audience senior citizen women in Japan or senior citizen bodybuilders in Japan? Whoever your audience is, you're going to have to customize your message for that audience, otherwise they won't hear what you're actually saying. And so consideration of audience is critical regardless of who that audience is. So with our values, emotion, and logic, We've identified what is important in terms of the point of view of the speaker. Also, who is your audience? And finally, that brings us to our topic. Now, that topic could be Denver Nuggets basketball. It could be senior proms in American high schools. It could be uh, anglerfish, weird, scary-looking creatures of the deep sea. Um, it could be dysfunctional relationships and drug abuse. Uh, doesn't matter what the topic is. But you have to identify what that topic is along with your speaker, your point of view, and your audience before you can figure out what values are we talking about sharing, what is it I want the audience to think at the end of this, and, and what is it exactly that I want the audience to feel in order to understand this. If you take all six of these elements of rhetoric into account, then regardless of if you're working with narrative or commercial topics, or, or genres, sorry, you will end up with very clear messaging. Now this is true of The Dark Knight. If you uh, want to show the model of a psychotic who just wants to cause damage and destruction, who you want the audience to feel is a despicable character and think needs to be stopped at all costs and see that character set up against The Dark Knight so that they understand exactly who Batman is because of the way that he is contrasted with this character. It's also true if you want the audience to value Doritos, and so you show them how instead of a guard dog, you have a guard falcon, and you protect those Doritos 
because they are for very worthwhile things, not, not the worthless things that a, do a guard dog is for. So suddenly the audience values Doritos more and hopefully they want to buy them because they are so valuable. Rhetoric is very often brought up in school in terms of persuasive essay writing, but what I want you to understand is regardless of if you're telling a story, selling a product, trying to convince your parents to let you borrow the car, writing an essay, analyzing the literary devices used in some great work of writing, any of those things, you should be thinking about rhetoric and you should be thinking about how do all of these pieces fit together because that will customize your message and that is what will allow people to actually hear you. So I need you to start seeing the values, the emotion, the logic. Start identifying who the speaker, who the audience, and what the topic are in life, in video and media. Because once you're able to start seeing the ways that people can create their messages, then you will be able to create your own messages, your own art, with these rhetorical elements in mind. And that is when you will become a master filmmaker and a master thinker in your life, which is, of course, why I am here. Remember, there will be a quiz over all of this material. You cannot master it until you have learned it. So I will quiz you to make sure you learn it. I will only answer written questions. So any questions that you have, make sure you write them down.